Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome back. And this is going to be part two of our approach to the adrenal gland. And we left off before commenting about, let's look at some benign lesions. So let's get going. There are a number of different adrenal cysts, endothelial, epithelia, the two most common. But you can see parasitic, and you can see pseudocysts. In our practice, parasitic is surely the least common. When you talk about adrenal cysts, they're just like cysts in the liver or cysts in the kidney. Water density well-defined, a thin wall capsule may be that does not enhance. Occasionally the wall will calcify, though that's most commonly in lymphangiomas as well as in old hematomas. You can see in this example when you look at that lesion with contrast or without, it's water density, well-defined, sitting above the right kidney, pushing on the liver, classic location for a adrenal mass, and being water density, this is a classic cyst. You will not need to remove this lesion. Here's another one. Sometimes the patients have pain. This patient presented with right upper quadrant pain, and was it due to the adrenal or not? It's going to be resected. These have no chance of rupturing. There's no increased chance of bleeding. They're benign, but sometimes they can be symptomatic. Again, coronals are wonderful for looking at the adrenals. And here's just one more with a kind of oval shape, which was an adrenal cyst. Again, adrenal cysts are typically water density. Here's another example. And they typically will push down on the kidney. Very nice example. Now, the second lesion I think is very important, and we see this more frequently now, and it can be a challenge because we see it in older patients who often are oncology patients, and you worry about the chance of malignancy, and that's an adrenal myelipoma. It's a benign tumor. It does contain at times brown fat, so I've seen PET-CT call it a metastasis, so you need to be very, very careful. It's composed of mature fat cells and hemopoietic tissue. It may also have calcifications, particularly punctate calcifications. What's very important about myelipoma is they're always benign. They have no malignant potential, but they may be hard to diagnose because they have different amounts of fat. They're benign. But the range of sizes is from a centimeter or two up to 17 to 20 centimeters. It's interesting, myelolipomas can grow over time. They can stay the same or even get smaller. They can have mass effect, and theoretically they can have hemorrhage, though it's exceedingly rare. But we talk about lesions above 5 cm, and urologists often talk about removing those lesions because of the possibility of bleed. Good article by Pereira, myelipomas are an uncommon benign tumor, prevalence in autopsy series is under 0.2%, they rise in the adrenal gland and occasionally can be extra adrenal. The challenge with myelipomas and why they become symptomatic is they bleed. Very, very important. Now when you look at these, there's a range of appearances. Here's a one centimeter lesion, right adrenal, purely fat. And here's one that's five centimeters, purely fat. A little bit of whiskering in that lesion. You wonder if there was old hemorrhage. Here's another one. Well, in this case, you see a little bit of fat and a punctate calcification. Now, it doesn't have the fat of the other lesions, and that's an important point. Not all of these myelipomas contain all fat. Some may have very minimal fat. They may be lipid-poor myelipomas. But to me, this little punctate calcification, and there's another example in the left adrenal gland, can be very helpful. Minimal fat and punctate calcifications, to me, are classic for adrenal myelipomas. Sometimes they have poor borders. Look at this myelipoma of the left adrenal gland. Very impressive indeed, minimal stranding. One could have worried about hemorrhage. And here's another one. Look at the size of that right adrenal myelipoma. Very heavy fat component, model density, could have bled in the past. There was no acute history of bleeding or pain. But again, this is probably the kind of lesion that will be removed prophylactically because of the risk of bleeding, because of its density appearance, and because of its size. And here it is very nicely in the coronal view. Another example of myelipoma, you can see some have lots of fat, some have very little fat. Some are oval, some are round. This one should do very well. You can see it on the coronal view as well. There's no need to do laparoscopic surgery unless the lesion is growing or the patients are having symptoms. And when it's growing, it's done to remove it before it bleeds. It's not going to be because of symptoms, typically, or it can be because of symptoms, but it's not just going to be because the patient has a lesion present. Another example, very prominent myelipoma with fat. And here's one of the larger ones. Again, how do you know it's not a sarcoma? But fat and calcification, 
good capsule, well-defined. This is a myelolipoma. Now, I will admit sometimes when the lesion is very fatty and there's no pseudocapsular or capsule, it can be tough. Could this be a liposarcoma? It's hard to argue it's not. When you look at all the images, you think it's a myelolipoma, but if someone gives you a hard time, you could understand why it could be problematic. This was resected and was a benign myelolipoma. Now, I mentioned about bleeding. Some surgeons will remove lesions above 5 cm because of the increased likelihood of bleed. This is a nice example of bleed into one of the earlier cases I showed you. Hemorrhage, this patient had a right adrenalectomy. Now, adrenal hemorrhage is very interesting. Typically, what do you see on non contrast scans? You see high attenuation. Can be unilateral or bilateral, though it's usually unilateral. If the patient has bilateral adrenal bleed, perhaps as a post-operative complication or result as anticoagulant therapy, then the patient can go in Addisonian crisis. Adrenal hemorrhage is more common in females. Again, uh, when it's bilateral, it can result in adrenal insufficiency. And it's often a tough diagnosis because the patient has symptoms of pain, maybe an acute abdomen, myocardial infarction, or even sepsis. When you look at causes for adrenal hemorrhage, we commented before, underlying tumor, Coumadin, patient with history of trauma, infection, hypercoagulability states, and perhaps stress. And here's a good example of a patient who had resection of the liver, resection of the kidneys post-trauma, high density, right adrenal gland. It's very dense. It's round. That's classic adrenal hemorrhage. Article by uh, Toki, the most common imaging features include a two to three centimeter oval hematoma, irregular hemorrhage obliterating the adrenal gland, perirenal hemorrhage or frat stranding, and uniform adrenal swelling with increased attenuation. Uh, so those are some of the findings we talk about in this article about adrenal injury. Traumatic adrenal injury occurs in about 5% of cases of blunt trauma and most commonly affects the right adrenal only. While rare, adrenal injury is an indicator of severe trauma and a prompt search for associated injuries should be done. The most common imaging feature of an adrenal injury is a two to three oval hematoma. So you could see on the CT appearance, um, often it's very suggestive, that high density, but sometimes, you know, it may only be suggestive. So a high clinical suspicion is very, very important. When you talk about adrenal hemorrhage, I'll just comment. The adrenal is oval around, hemorrhage obscuring the gland may occur if hemorrhage is large enough. Swelling of the gland is not uncommon. Periadrenal hemorrhage or retroperitoneal hemorrhage indeed can occur. So the number of specific appearances. Here's a classic case of right adrenal hemorrhage, oval high density adrenals. You see that it's hemorrhage still proven otherwise. Now, sometimes it's bilateral. Now, I do make the point always at lectures, and we had a course last week, and I made the point that very rarely do I see rule out adrenal hemorrhage. I usually see it for two weeks after I've diagnosed adrenal hemorrhage. This patient was post-meningioma resection, should be doing fine, there was no complications, but patient you know, it doesn't feel well, can't eat. You don't see an abscess. You're considering an abscess or tumor or something else. What you see is round, dense adrenal glands. This was a patient with bilateral adrenal hemorrhage presenting as adisonian crisis. They replaced the patient's um, uh, hormonal uh, adrenal uh, enzymes, and the patient did fine. Another example, again, bilateral adrenal hemorrhage, those are the one you worry about. Now, sometimes with unilateral hemorrhage, you can figure out what's going on. This is a large bleed. And yes, it could be due to Coumadin. The patient wasn't on Coumadin. It could be due to trauma. The patient had no trauma. You got to think about maybe an underlying tumor. This patient had an underlying primary lung cancer. So primary lung cancer uh, to the adrenal can bleed. I've seen cases where the patient's presentation is right flank pain. And then you see this bleed of the adrenal and you say, well, maybe it's primary adrenal. You think of that, but then you look at the lungs and it's a primary lung cancer. So you realize what you're doing is seeing the metastasis to the adrenal gland as the presentation. And occasionally, as in this case, primary adrenal carcinomas can also enhance. With old hemorrhage, what can happen? You can get rim-like calcification. The adrenals can become very small, end-stage renal disease, very tiny adrenals, kind of looking at a patient with histoplasmosis, or in this case with bilateral adrenals that are densely calcified, very nicely shown in that example. Occasionally, I'll see this appearance, a large adrenal rim-like calcification. When you see that, 
I've seen it now with lymphangioma. We just wrote an article, but very dense calcification. You have to think about old reliable and old hematoma. Sometimes the patient has a good history. Sometimes they don't, but it's a very good scenario. If you think about it, what could give you rim calcifications? Old hematoma, lymphangioma. But it's primary adrenal carcinoma can calcify, but you're not going to have that rim-like calcification. It's not going to look so good around that lesion. Uh, so a very important diagnosis. Now, I spoke about different tumors. I went through some benign tumors. Let's talk about malignancy. And the classic one is going to be metastasis. We'll speak about primary adrenal carcinoma, which is rare. We'll speak about FIOS as we are giving better treatment and better diagnosis and management. And we'll also maybe touch on neuroblastoma. So if you look at some numbers, Song made the point that we can look at adrenal lesions and based on their appearance, put it in the benign and malignant category, that most adrenal lesions that are benign are very smooth, but that is just not enough. For individual morphologic features in diagnosing malignancy, irregular margins had a 30% or so sensitivity and 95% specificity, and an enhancing rim had up to a 13% sensitivity and a 99% specificity. So you can see the numbers, no matter how you do them, aren't all that great. Very, very important. Now, we spoke about adrenals before in terms of numbers, and I always like to remind people again about this point that no malignant lesions occurred in patients without a known history of cancer in looking at these additional uh, uh, studies looking at adrenal lesions. Now, when I speak about adrenal lesions, I could start probably with primary adrenal carcinoma. It's a very popular diagnosis, something you need to know about, but it's fairly infrequent. It makes up a small percent of malignant tumors, peak incidence in the fourth and fifth decades of life, a bit more common in female than men, but functioning tumors are much more common, particularly Cushing's in women, and it's rarely bilateral. Over 50% of tumors will have an excess steroid hormone production, can be any of the steroids, so it's very important um, uh, to uh, look carefully at that. The most common presentation is Cushing's, though other types of hormones such as androgen secretion, estrogen secretion, and primary aldosteronism are all things to consider. But again, uh, when you're thinking about Cushing's, I'm thinking about primary carcinoma. Now, when you look at primary adrenal carcinoma, when lesions present as non-hyperfunctioning, they're going to present later. And so flank pain, fever, weight loss, symptoms related to METs are all going to be common. Uh, when you have a highly functional tumor like a Cushing's or a FIO, you'll often diagnose the lesions when they're smaller. Now, when you look at primary adrenal carcinoma, about a third have calcifications, average size about 9 centimeters, enhancement and necrosis may be seen. When we stage the patients, we look for local extension or invasion. We look for the presence of lymphadenopathy. Vascular invasion is not uncommon. Renal veins and IVC are things we think about. Then you can see distant meds, lung, bone, or liver. The problem with adrenal carcinoma, there's no good therapy for those patients. Surgery is probably the best therapy with aggressive resection, but often patients will present with distant metastasis or local spread of disease. Nice example here, classic left adrenal mass, pushes on the patient's left kidney, solid, minimal enhancement. This was a primary adrenal carcinoma. Very nice vasculature on both the arterial and venous side, which weren't invaded. But you can see very nicely the extent of that tumor and its orientation. We can look at this case of a left adrenal mass, which also has metastasis to the adrenal. And you can see it very nicely on the coronal view. Coronals are very good for showing a normal right adrenal, but a mass in the patient's left adrenal. Very nice scene in this example. Or here's just a couple more images. Little punctate calcification seen. Now, I mentioned that adrenal carcinomas can be very large when they're not hyperfunctioning. Here's a classic example. 15 centimeter lesion, some vascularity, some necrosis. Um, this is just classic. Can you get METs this large? Melanoma can give large metastasis. Lymphoma can be very large. But when you see this kind of enhancement, to me, it's always going to be primary adrenal carcinoma. Here's the same case on a sagittal view. Another example here, large right adrenal mass. Could it be pheo? Could it be lymphoma? Sure. But the lesion does not wash out as much as you would like. You're thinking malignancy, though it could be unusual benign tumors. I've seen adrenal hemorrhage look like that, but 
Uh, that's pretty, pretty uncommon. Here's some more views. Just a very nice example of a primary adrenal cortical carcinoma. Or this case, most cases I showed you were somewhat cystic but solid components. This one is really cystic. There's mural nodules. This again, left adrenal mass, cystic, classic for a carcinoma. And here you can see the cystic lesion, some rim-like calcification, mass effect on the IVC, and mass effect on the left uh, renal artery and renal vein. When you look at all of the images, here's a splenic artery stretched. Just a beautiful example, okay? And you can see it here as well. Adrenal carcinomas on the left side can be confused with other tumors. I showed you examples before about pancreas. I showed you retroperitoneal masses that may not be specifically the adrenal. But so there's a range of appearances. And just because something is cystic doesn't mean it's not a carcinoma. And this was a primary adrenal carcinoma with solid and cystic components. Now, there are other lesions of the adrenal gland, and the most common is going to be metastasis. Many tumors commonly go to the adrenal gland, but let's take a break here and pick it up in five minutes, and I'll be right back.